can I? We, yeah. I don't mean to interrupt, but if anyone is interested in really, really understanding what Dr. Bickman just said, please read Sickening by John Abramson. And there's this whole chapter on the story of insulin and how they did this and how they basically stuck type 2 diabetics on insulin and caused so much morbidity and mortality. And I spend countless hours in my clinic trying to get type 2 diabetics off Good insulin because it's insane to put any type 2 diabetic on insulin. I've had people come to my clinic with A1Cs of 11, 12, 15, unmeasurable. And if they make the dietary change, their insulins normalize. I mean, their A1Cs normalize and so do their fasting insulin. And so, thank you. Continue, sorry. Yeah. Well, in fact, just to put a fine point on that, uh, giving a type 2 diabetic insulin is like giving an alcoholic another glass of wine, hoping that that extra alcohol is going to solve the problem. When ironically and tragically, it's it, you're giving them more of the very thing that's caused the issue. So with statins, the evidence, I, mean, I would want the audience to know that the evidence is deeply conflicted, uh, that the any mortality benefit that is ever claimed, even by drug-sponsored trials, it is always presented in a very deceiving way, which is a relative risk, a relative risk. So if someone has a 1% chance of having a heart attack and you take that 1% chance and lower it down to a half of a percent, then we say, oh my, there was a 50% reduction in heart disease risk. Well, what's the actual meaningfulness of reducing the risk of a heart attack from 1% to a half of a percent? I would say meaningful, that's nothing. But what's the consequence? Because there's a trade-off to declaring war on the body's ability to make cholesterol, which as we described it is a molecule of life. Well, for that half of a percent, which is how it actually should be presented in absolute terms, a half of a percent reduction in um, a heart attack, it, there could come with it a 50% increase in the risk, that would be a relative term, but uh, a dramatic increase in the risk of Alzheimer's disease or a dramatic increase in the risk of cancer or in type 2 diabetes, especially for women, statin therapy appears to be absolutely catastrophic. And, and I think, I don't want to say there should never be a place for statins because the work that I alluded to earlier with David Diamond and Paul Mason, we found that if a person has a high triglyceride to HDL ratio, that statins did appear to have a mortality benefit. But even then, I would say it would pale in comparison to changing diet. If you can improve your triglyceride to HDL ratio by changing your diet, you are going to have a much, much better uh, cardiovascular risk profile than any other thing you can do. So the, the evidence, again, just to wrap it up on statins is deeply problematic. It's very, very conflicted. Anyone who says otherwise is deliberately ignoring a mountain of evidence. And I think that overwhelmingly, if not every time, the negative consequences of the drug outweigh the possible benefit um, or the beneficial consequences. Uh, and this is, a, this is a fact of all drugs. You're putting something unnatural into your body. Um, it is just simply gonna be what happens now. And it'll be a balance. The person has to ask themselves, are the consequences I want worth the consequences I don't want? And in the case of statins, I think overwhelmingly that balance is tipped to the negative. Yeah, and, and I'll just add that, because uh, you mentioned, is there any role for statins? I don't believe there's any role for statins in primary prevention of disease. Well said. I, I agree think completely. that is like the key. Now, when you have sick patients, that are not even gonna ever listen to this podcast, are never gonna change their bread, butter, desserts, cereals, orange juice, all this nonsense that they've been consuming for 70 years. By all means, give them whatever drugs because that's the system we have. You're not gonna convince them otherwise. And I don't know, like, I don't know. But especially if they've had an event before. Yeah. I mean, so I like that you called out a primary because it does appear to have a much more substantial benefit in the case of a secondary, secondary yeah. where if someone has had a heart attack, a statin does appear to reduce the risk of a subsequent heart attack. But also, I mean, maybe just to make a diplomatic conclusion to my thoughts, if you are worried, put all of your blood tests on the shelf for a moment and go in and get a coronary artery calcium scan. Um, a really well done study looked at the overall mortality benefit and found that cholesterol levels didn't matter at all um, you could have people high or low cholesterol if they had no calcified um, calcifications in the coronary artery. There was no lifestyle 
Um, there's no, no mortality benefit whatsoever to the statin. And once again, regardless of their cholesterol levels, if the person had a higher score of calcification in the coronary artery, then statins did appear to have a mortality benefit. So all the more reason not to base the decision on whether statins are used on a clinical, on a, on a blood marker, but rather actually do a scan and just look at the state of the heart and in, I, in reality, rather than a surrogate. And I would add to it, like you could look at the full metabolic panel. A really common issue that comes up is, is patients that had a heart attack five, 10 years ago, and they've really changed their lifestyle. And they also removed the in, insults, the, the, what I consider yeah. the triggers. So something you recently posted, and I think is just so important is the role of stress in metabolic disease, heart disease. Now, this is not new information that Dr. Bickman shared because when I was in medical school and I was le learning about the Framingham Heart Study and, and all of these basic re research that drives uh, our recommendations, stress was the second risk factor for having a heart attack. So they already knew that from studies long, long, long ago, uh, obviously smoking, right? So one of the considerations here is when you have a patient that had a terrible disease, but then removed the smoking, removed the stress, cleaned up their diet, their, their metabolic pattern is cleaned up. I think that's a time to remove the statin, especially when they're older, over 65, they made those changes over the last 10, 15 years, they're in better shape by all means, don't go into your golden years sub suppressing your cholesterol production, increasing your risk for dementia and the like. And, and that's like this tricky one that I wanted to bring up with you on because yes, I think we both agree. Primary prevention, no role. I don't, I can't, I can't see an argument when we're like sick people. There's a lot of arguments. The, the data is all over the place. It's very, very hard to say someone who removed the initial triggers and has done the lifestyle has done the work should not then suppress their cholesterol production because of a number i think that's wild and crazy and i battle all the time about this yeah yeah that that is one of the what's interesting though about talking about statins is i have a, a host of physician friends that live near byu here in utah that that are all in they see things the way we see them they're all in they are deprescribing anti-diabetic medications, anti-hypertensive medications just every day. But every one of them says, I just am really reluctant to take them off the statin. And that is born completely from a fear of litigation. Yeah. It's just this this off chance that someone has a heart attack and then it is found out that they had deprescribed a statin. That right. physician's life is ruined. You know, their their career is just gonna be tanked. And so that it is the statin that we, we are just so enamored we have been so convinced of its utility that we can't that even when we know everything we know and i'm i'm sympathetic to the fact that i don't have that same litigation right because i'm a professor um not a physician but that is the one that that, that idea is so deep-seated that we're it, it's hard to it's hard to point the finger at the statin and i'll just add the most lucrative drug of all time is lipitor and continues to be and is more lucrative than like the next three drugs combined. So let's not forget that. And then the other part is based on current guidelines, something like 70 or 80% of the population would be a candidate for these drugs. Wow. I'm sorry, there is no, there is, that, that is not possible. You cannot, I mean, unless everyone's eating seed oils and carbs, right? We got it. Yep. Um, yep. I wanna move on. Thank you for like talking about statins because it's so hard to get anyone to even listen. And my patients, it's like, 50% of my conversations are about this. I wanna go on to something that's a little more sort of of this time. And I saw, again, you recently posted about this and I am going through an education process. GLP-1 peptides, mm -hmm. glucagon-like peptides. These are not petroleum-based pharmaceuticals for the record. They are part of a group of uh, substances which we call peptides. They're amino acids. I actually use other peptides in my practice more mm -hmm. recently, I think. N not for this podcast, but uh, things like BPC-157, apromorlin, sermormulin, and the like. I think these are really special things that are currently, there's litigation over it because they're trying to privatize it. It's, it's wild. But you mentioned the GLP-1s and what everyone is seeing right now is a huge battle. You see, you, you get conflicting information. First, it was the miracle drug, right? Elon Musk posted about it. Everyone yep. came looking for it. Then, oh my God, it just causes all these side effects. It's scary. Don't give it to anyone. Then, oh my God, you can give it, but only give the one that's owned by the pharmaceutical industry. By no means should you compound it because that's yeah. dangerous. And so I'm like, 
<laughs> I'm like, what's going on? Because this this sounds familiar. It's it's another yeah. thing. And and whenever you know, ivermectin was a similar story. All of this conflicting research. And so whenever I see a huge push to suppress something, lights go off, and I'm like, uh huh. There's something yeah. there because someone's about to get their money taken away, and that's why they're intervening. So, can you speak to GLP ones? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> so GLP GLP one these medications or GLP one was first discovered as a in efforts to understand the the almost immediate reversal of type two diabetes in people who've had gastric bypass procedure. So that's the origins of it. Indeed, when I was getting my PhD, we were I was my lab my PI uh, my my mentor was one of the first labs funded by drug companies to study these incretins, this class of hormones coming from the gut. Um, and my view on GLP-1 agonists has, it has evolved as the world has become remarkably interested in them, to, to put it politely, um, where I have never seen anything like this, where you have people bragging about being on the drug that is very uncommon. Um, it's become just sort of a social craze for the reasons you've mentioned, where you have some influential people who share their results, and then it just, of course, has taken on a life of its own. My view is a little complicated because at its lowest dose, these GLP-1 agonists appear to have a nice ability to, to gently reduce the rate at which the food moves through the intestines, so slow down gastric emptying, which is not uncommon. That's something that happens um, with like allulose, a rare mm -hmm. sugar. I'm interested in allulose because it also slows down gastric emptying. That helps you feel a little fuller longer. Well, that'll help control appetite a bit. But two, back to GLP-1 agonists, it will lower glucagon. And, you, and you, remember, the original intention for these drugs was as an anti-diabetic. And so if you can lower glucagon levels, you lower glucose output from the liver, which lowers glucose levels in the blood, which helps insulin come down. No surprise, the person becomes more insulin sensitive, of course, in combination with the fact that they are eating less. And, and I, I would look at the drugs at that lower dose and just say, you know what, I can give this one a passing grade. Um, I really could. And even to this day, I still think in someone who's just really having a hard time controlling their appetite, then this drug will give uh, a, a, an, an induced appetite control. It's you've not really learned to control your appetite. The drug has helped you, and 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 it's at a very low dose, so it's affordable. And the consequences appear to be pretty modest. And the consequence being, I feel sick to my stomach. Now, however, now that we have multiplied that dose by several times, going from this original low dose of about a half a milligram, which it is with with Ozempic, now with Wegovy and, and then others that are kind of following suit, it is multiples higher. And now all the weight loss is coming primarily because you their their intestines paralyze. Um, you're now you're now you're not moving food almost at all anymore. And so food is staying in the stomach and actually putrefying. Um, and, and so people will talk about the like the burps that they have, and, and it, it is like this horrific smell. It's because you have f food that is rotting in your intestines because your stomach isn't moving food anymore. Um, so there's this very real phenomenon of, of paralysis of the intestines, which can be absolutely life threatening. Um, and there are there are other mechanisms still at play here, but that is the primary mechanism for the weight loss. The person just starts starving. Um, because they feel sick to their stomach all the time. And someone listening may say, well, that's fine. I can handle some starvation. You also have to appreciate that there's the risk of substantial nutrient deficiencies like protein, which is partly why almost half of all of the weight loss that these people are losing is coming from lean mass. And when you talk about an older population, and you and I have alluded to an older people multiple times, that is a wicked combination because let's say the day comes, the person loses 100 pounds and, and 60 pounds is from fat, 40 pounds is from muscle and bone. Um, it is, if they stop taking the drug, their ability to gain all that fat back is utterly uncompromised. They can gain all of that fat back and likely will very quickly as they start eating the same way they used to because what they thought was controlled cravings was actually them just feeling really sick because of the drug. 
What they will not gain back in their 60s and beyond is that 40 pounds of muscle and bone and other lean mass. And so the overall outcome of what they're made of, um, when I would say the inevitable arrives and they decide to get off that high dose of that drug because of either the financial cost or the feeling of nausea, it be reaches a point of, of being unsustainable. What they gain back in the new body composition that they have is going to be uh, frankly disastrous. So my, my thoughts, just to finish that, is, is uh, they're a little complicated. Yeah. I believe if someone uses the GLP-1 agonist at a low dose and combines it with a low carbohydrate diet, that, uh, then I think that is a very, very winning combination. And that's what I wanted to add. I think you just illustrated the two stories that are going on. On one side, you have really great outcomes, and on the other side, you have these scary side effects. And what I've noticed clinically, because I have been using them, is if you give these drugs as recommended on this mo monthly escalating dose to someone who hasn't participated in a lifestyle intervention and is still not and is still eating too much. If you use it as a quote unquote weight loss drug, you lose. It's not good. They're not exercising. Muscle mass goes away. Lean body mass. It's a bad outcome. If you have someone who has initiated a lifestyle plan and is weightlifting, and I think this is key, if you're maintaining muscle yeah, well strength, said. Well said. then it at an appropriate low dose, not following these weird guidelines, can be a really cool adjuvant that gives people like a little bit of freedom to feel even easier with their diet and it can help with their metabolism and start healing them and, and, and help get rid of some of that like stubborn fat. You know, and again, these are these patients that come to me that are 50, 60, and they've done the work. Like they're healthy, they've done the work, but they wanna see what next, you know? And, and those are some men that can get on testosterone replacement if their T is low, and again, that I also support at a very low appropriate dose, replacing them back to physiological levels, not these super crazy, yeah. you know, everything is, has multiple stories. And I appreciate you sharing that, you know, we don't have a lot of time, but it, it would be silly not to ask you. Cause I know you're not just a scientist. I saw that you, you sing, you're a family man. Yeah. You've got, look, I think it's really important. The whole season is really focused on the mind, body, spirit connection. And I wanted to have you on because we never got a chance to talk and you are this anchor point for me when it comes to knowledge and That's science, nice. you know? But can you speak to, cause I think that being focused on your mental health what, is not just about like, like spirituality or, or just, what I think that it's about is being a dynamic person. It's being someone who, who pursues artistic endeavors, who pursues really important social relationships. Obviously you and me are out here with passion, sharing our message. Like these are the things that really help people with their mental. And it's when you start finding that balance with your mental that you can get some spirituality in your life and realize that there is something more that to this whole story that we're talking about, mm -hmm. that we have an ability as scientists and doctors to measure. I believe that there's an energetic field around us and I do believe it. And I've also been embraced this idea that there has to be some faith and belief in our lives. You mentioned earlier in the podcast, and this is what I'm bringing up, we are treating science as a replacement for belief, faith, and religion. And what happens is science is not built for that. And it is actually specifically outlined by the scientific method that that's not how we work. We try to disprove ourselves that whatever, what you said, you know, mm -hmm. but I believe having faith and belief and passion is the only way we really find our optimal health. Um, how much of that is part of your life? You know, how mm -hmm. much is singing? How much is family? How much yeah. do you think about spirituality and the, the, the mental piece? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I do firmly believe that we are more than a bag of meat and bones. Yes. I, I deeply, deeply believe that there's something more than more to us than that. And, and I believe the fact that we are even having this conversation, the fact that we have self-awareness, ego in its sort of cleanest sense of the word, I think does suggest there's something different about humans than other animals on the planet. Um, uh, and I deeply believe that, of course. I like that you mentioned family. I'm a very religious person, um, you know, uh, member uh, my, my my faith. BYU is a religious school. People could look it up. I won't elaborate on that. But very, very committed to my faith. 
um, for multiple reasons, in addition to a deep conviction that it's it, it, there's some truth that, that is built on truth, but also because I have such a conviction of the value of community. And that is a lot of what I think is going wrong in the world. As people are retreating from religion, it's not even necessarily in some instances that it's the religion itself um, that is contributing to a healthy, robust country um, and communities, but rather the sense of community, that these are people that I wouldn't otherwise be mingling with that I am. Um, for example, there is a, a, a family in, that I go to church with. They're going through a, a terrible divorce. And so with another um, man um, in, in my faith, we went and visited her just to determine what her needs were to see where the church, where the members of the church can step in and help. And those are moments that really matter. You know, at the end of my life, what I've accomplished and published will matter very, very little. That no success that I realize in life will compensate if I've failed my family and my community. That no success in life will compensate will compensate for failure in the home. So at the end of everything, my wife and my children get the absolute best of me. And and I and that is largely it is very heavily influenced because of my faith and my belief that that this is a family unit that that matters forever uh, if, at the risk of sounding a little cheesy, that there's something more permanent to this relationship than there is just in this life. I, I firmly believe that there, that um, our existence won't end. Um, so, um, and, and you know, you mentioned um, my singing. Yes, I sometimes will sing in a barbershop quartet, but only at church functions. You know, it's so <laughs> embarrassing. I, I love to sing and I, I have a, a, a decent voice when I need to. But I, I love playing piano, um, at, even at church sometimes, uh, every Sunday um, when they need someone to step in and play some of the hymns. I love playing piano. I love music. And and have, that's been a very rich part of my life. But it's it, all of this, I guess, just to um, conclude the my thought, is, is a testament to my conviction that we are, as I've said, more we are more than just this physical experience there's more to us than that and and i think the more the, the further we get from that view the more difficult it becomes to maintain communities because then we all risk becoming more atomistic individuals where we think i don't need other people um that it, that does not work especially within the united states where i'll assume most of your audience is listening to this democracy and in a capitalist system, which I love and applaud and believe in it deeply, having been around the world and lived in multiple different countries, the moment you start to rob a common morality from it, it's it doesn't work as well. Where where these are these are structures of society that work with a group of people who have a common moral view of, of, of life and, and the universe. And I don't mean that that's to say they're all the same religion, not at all, even if they are religious or not, but to embrace a common moral framework, which religion just helps happen, I believe is fundamental to this country surviving. Now that's getting a little fatalistic, but regardless, um, I, I'm at the end of everything, at the end of my life, I wanna be known for having been a faithful, devoted husband and father and someone who was very quick to help people in my community. And having a faith structure just helps make those connections. Not that it's impossible, not at all. There could be an atheist who is very deeply connected with his neighbors and, and her neighbors and goes out of their way to make those opportunities happen. It just gets harder. Um, so yeah, I, I'm unabashedly religious, super orthodox in my own faith and wouldn't have it any other way. I, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing. I just think uh, so many scientists are thought to be kind of these one track, one trick ponies. Yeah. And, and what, what you realize is that being a scientific mind does not mean you cannot have a faith, spiritual side. And, and, and to echo your sentiment, it, it's not about theism. It's mm -hmm. not about religiosity. That's a version that works for you. It might not work for someone else. It's about understanding that without community, without faith and without belief, you're missing the critical piece the most yep. critical piece and 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 i'm gonna leave it there thank you for your time dr bigman i want everyone to know 
and go out there and get why we get sick. I think it's a foundational special book. Uh, I've obviously read it and and I, it sits on my shelf and I reference it and I share it with patients. Um, if anyone is interested, what, what are the best platforms? Obviously see your Instagram, um, but but how could they reach you? Yeah, yeah. Thanks again, Gary. This was great. I really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, I'm pretty active on social media where I try to just make little tidbits of uh, just little lessons where I want people to learn more about how their body works. So be com people can find me on social media at Ben Bickman, PhD. And then I'm in the process of really starting to have a repository for all of my information through a website called InsulinIQ. Um, oh. uh, dot com. So that's going to really be my platform for sharing my own view of things in my own unique way of teaching ideas. Um, but then, of course, my book, uh, Why We Get Sick, um, people can learn a deep, deep dive on all the things we spoke about and more. Um, and then you can get that anywhere books are sold. Thank you, Dr. Bickman. And until next time, goodbye. <laughs>